Sunday, uh, it's not to be taken uh, right train, but the Lord has kept you and has kept me, and He woke you up and gave you the strength and the willingness to come. There are many people who have woken up just like you, but they are not willing to come. But inside of your heart, you are willing to be in the house of the Lord, like the servant of God, uh, David, who said, I was glad when they say to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Let us go into the house of the Lord. I wish uh, that all God's people would uh, rise up from their beds with such a yearning. Hallelujah. Urging others and, you know, they themselves uh, rising up to run into the house of the Lord. Yeah, because that is a character. I would say... It is the expected. It is the normal. Uh, waking up not feeling like God to God's house is not normal. What is normal? According to divine economy, hallelujah, what is normal is to rise up wronging and desiring to be found in the presence of the Lord. Therefore, I thank God so much for each one of us because I know uh, none of us has been dragged uh, to be in this place. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. Amen and amen. Shall we go to the book uh, that is named after Prophet Jeremiah, chapter number one? 
Jeremiah chapter number one. There are a few verses I, I want to read from there. The word of the Lord came to me saying, I'm reading verses number four. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and to overthrow build and to plant. Amen. Now these words are familiar to many of us. They are very precise. They are very direct. God himself is addressing himself to a man who I believe at this point he must have been a very young person. And he says that I am appointing you as an appointment. Jeremiah is getting an appointment letter. And in the appointment letter God is sparing out. He's giving him the job description. Like any appointment should have a job description. Amen. When you are appointed, it's because there is something you are supposed to do. And your employer ought to give you a job description. Jeremiah is getting one which is very clear and precise. But even before that, the Lord is saying, Before I formed you, that is in your mother's womb, I knew you. I don't want to get into the you know the wonder of this message because we can we can preach from that statement and not move out of there just the fact that even before you came here on this planet earth don't just imagine that the only person god knew before they came here was jeremiah you can say even me hallelujah can we say even me I am telling you, this is a fact. Before you arrived here in this planet, God knew you. He knew. He had planned your coming at the time you came. Your coming was not an accident. He brought you just in time. And when he did, it was for a specific purpose which had to be fulfilled in your generation. You better go through this life understanding there is something for me from the Father that needs to be done during this time. Amen. We are purposeful beings. We, don't, we didn't just happen. We didn't just come. Before I formed you, before you were ever visible, I knew you. He goes on to say, before you were born, I set you apart. Meaning, I had a ministry, I had a work for you that required a setting apart. Amen and amen. Then I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. That is before he even came around. Before he was born. 
he was a prophet. What were you before you were born to the Lord? Do you know? Have you ever heard? I'm saying we can spend time on these scriptures. They're very interesting. Of course, Jeremiah is complaining and uh, retorting that uh, he is only young. He doesn't know. He understands what God is saying, but now he says, I think that is too hard. Uh, like Moses, like others, he doesn't want to move. God says, uh -uh, you're going to do it. Don't fear. I will be with you. Oh, the assurance that God can give to somebody, uh, Jeremiah gets it. But you see, something else happens. To all your weaknesses, God can handle all your weaknesses. When God appoints you, you know we have said he does not, he does not send, he, he does not do what? He does not call the equipped. He equips those whom he has called. So when God calls you, you may be weak like Jeremiah. You may be only a child. But God is going to empower you to do that which he has appointed you to perform. Amen and amen. So the Lord also had to do that particular operation. He touched him assuring him he touched him and gave him I, that to me is like symbolic in our understanding today it's like the act of feeding somebody with the spirit of god now in this this one it comes like he touched you know his ribs he gave him his word he empowered him uh, so that he would speak uh, the message of god and tells him not to fear so to me that is like a, an, an inferring of the holy spirit and uh, then the lord reached out to his hand and touch my mouth I mean and say to me now I have put my words in your mouth see today I appoint you over the nations ah and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down amen to uproot and to tear down oh so that what is uprooted will not even have a chance to grow oh, to destroy and to overthrow to build and to plant. I like the last part. To build and he is not just going to uproot and scatter. He is also going to plant. He is going to build, he is going to plant and he is going to build. Hallelujah. That, that, is, that means you are going to bring into the situation that I am calling you into you are going to bring total transformation. Oh, come on now. Wherever I am pressing you, you will be a transformer. <laughs> you will transform the situation in that particular location. Because first of all, you are going to do what? To uproot and to do what? To tear down. You uproot and tear down. You will also do what? You are going to destroy and do what? Ah, before you build, you are going to destroy and overthrow. And finally, you are going to, to build and to do what? And to plan. I can almost speak with certainty that what is being built and what is being planted is not what had been approached. It must be a totally different thing. Hallelujah. And that's what brings transformation. If any man be in Christ, he has been uprooted. Come on. All the things have been torn down. Now, he is a new creation. The past is gone. Behold, everything has become new. Total transformation is what is going to be happening. Why am I reading these words of scripture this morning? Why you know that uh, we have not been very much in the Old Testament. I am reading this to introduce us to the remainder of Acts chapter number 19. Hallelujah. And before we revisit Acts chapter number 19, I want you to reflect on the fact that the ministry that God was giving Jeremiah, to me it's very similar 
to the ministry that God is giving the church. When the church was born on the day of Pentecost, it was a very young church. The church in the book of Acts is a very young church. Hallelujah. But the Lord is saying, like he said to Jeremiah, before you happened, I knew you. To the church, before you were born in your mother's womb, you know, I had appointed you for a work. But before you start doing the work, I'm going to touch your lips. Oh, come on now. I want you to see the typology, the ministerial typology that is right there. Before the church was commissioned, Jesus had said, tarry you in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father is fulfilled. And at that point, we understand that this happened on the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, or fully come, the Spirit of the Lord came down. Every one of them in the upper room was filled with the Holy Spirit. What did they do? They spoke the new time. I didn't even want to say the new time. I wanted to leave it there. They spoke. When the Spirit comes, what do you do? You speak. We know what they spoke. They did not speak something they wanted to speak or something they wanted to say. They spoke that which God himself had pressed in their mouth. What the Bible says, they spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance. The inquiry. They spoke as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. He made them to say the things they were saying. And we know what they were saying. They were not saying something about themselves. They were saying something about God himself. Just like Jeremiah. God touched his mouth so that he may speak. When God did that, Jeremiah had to speak everything I have commanded you. Come on now. Now we see Jeremiah has to speak everything God has commanded him and do everything God wants him to do. Can I say that is, uh, that is uh, the mandate of the church? Not to do what you want, but to do everything God wants you to do. To go where God wants you to go. To say what God wants you to say. The Spirit of God is not to make you a chatterbox around the village. The Spirit of God comes to give you utterance to say what God wants to say. So it's not just a religious thing. Now we are Pentecostals, Hura, Hura Shamba, Hura. Yeah, wait, now we're going to wanna, wanna invent this out. Oh, don't invent your tongues. You have to speak that which God is asking you to speak or giving you utterance to speak. Amen and amen. Yeah. I would rather that nobody spoke in tongues if they had to speak their own tongues. Pretending that they are God. You would rather speak quick. Praise the name of Jesus. Believe God for it. He does that all the time. So the mandate that Jeremiah is getting, I find it very similar to the mandate that we have received as a church of Jesus Christ in this New Testament period. I also want you to see something. That the mandate we have received, the assignment that God has given us, involves uprooting and scattering. 
Are we together? It involves destroying and are you following me? I want you to be in the spirit. You are brood and destroy. Hallelujah. Let them put, let's put them together. Let's pair them together. You have the Bible. I want you to read the Bible. What is the first thing you're going to do? You're going to you have fruit and then tear down. That is destroying the whole field. Okay? Number two, what is the pair? Destroy and overthrow. And finally, which is the last pair, build and run. That is exactly what God has told us to do. We are going to uproot. We are going to tear down. What are you going to uproot and to tear down? You think it is maize or corn in the garden? Ah, don't you miss the point. That, that's why Jeremiah was fear, Jeremiah was fearing. Because this is not a fruit in trees. It is easier to uproot the cedars of Lebanon than to uproot people in the kingdom of darkness. If you understand the message, you know the assignment is a heavy one. You are dealing with people. You are dealing with human beings. God is sending you to the people. And he is saying there are things which have been built up. There are things that have been growing. And they are very strong. They have already occupied the ground. You have to uproot and tear down. If it were simple trees, that would not be a problem. But when it, it means things which have grown in human beings, in communities and societies, it means you are up for big trouble. Number two, you are going to destroy and demolish. That is total annihilation of things. That is not trace is going to be left of what you have uprooted and scattered, destroyed and overthrown. You are going to bring a new order. You are going to obliterate, bring an end to an existing thing and bring new something which has not been there. And that therefore you finally have got to plant and build. We are planters and builders. We don't just destroy. The church is not a destructive force. However, we have to destroy before we plant and build. Blessed be the name of Jesus. There is no better testimony to that than the ministry of Paul. Even as it is clearly stipulated in Acts chapter number 19. So, while I have the time, let us just run there briefly. Verses number 8. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months. That's a good season. Amen? After he was over with the disciples, he goes to the synagogue and is going to be ministering there the word of God for about three months. However, the Jews are going to be contentious one more time. And he is going to move out. So let's read the word. Arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Please notice what was he dealing with for three months. It was about the kingdom of God. Remember, Paul's message, if you like it, was nothing but about the kingdom. Praise the name of the Lord. It was about the kingdom of God. Of God. 
But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussion daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia had the word of the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> the Jews <clears throat> are opposing the message. Let me make a quick statement, especially for those who are steep, who, who want to go out and preach. Don't waste your time with contentious people. I didn't say you don't preach to them. But when you discover that they are resistant, leave them. Can I say that again? If they are resistant to the message, don't waste your time with them. Be like a Paul. Go with those. Follow those who have the ears to hear. By all means, go to everybody. But if they are resistant, just do like Paul. So he moves on to the Gentiles. In this case, he took those who were believing, the believers, and he took them to a separate corner. Instead of keeping them in a contentious environment in the synagogue, he put them in the hall, the school of Tyrannus, one called Tyrannus. He found a place. Come on, find a place for God's people where you can do ministry. There's nothing wrong in moving aside and leaving some pharaohs. Some pharaohs need to be left aside. They continue with their contentions while you do ministry. So Paul continues to preach for two good years in the same place. Two good years in Ephesus. The school of tyranny. And from Ephesus, during those two years, the word of God was preached in the whole region. And somebody say amen. Bible says, this went on for two years. So that all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia had the word of the Lord. Uh, I want you to notice something. Everything sometimes is not written in the rhymes of the Bible. But we can all, all ask ourselves, how did everybody in the province of Asia hear the word of God while Paul had not moved from Ephesus? For two and a half years or thereabouts. I'm just saying this very quickly because it's a subject that can be handled also for a long time. When it's good to understand the progressiveness of the proclamation message. I mean, from the word go in the book of Acts, Jesus said that the message was starting from where? The message started to be preached from Jerusalem. Do you realize Jerusalem was a city? It was a town. Yeah. If you want to preach in a new place, in a nation, go to its main city. There's all the reason to do that. Pepper took so many years. To really get hold of things. And you check, if you check the, 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 the history of uh, this organization, this church, within the country, you realize where do they start? They started rocketing themselves in a place like Sunna, Migori. Uh, what do you go to Sunna and Migori to do? Unless the only place you are interested in is Sunna, Migori, not Kenya. Where else did they go? <laughs> They located themselves somewhere in town. It's like they were avoiding Nairobi by all means. So it took us much longer than it should have taken us. Huh? Because we started in the peripheries. That was not the method of Paul. Paul was starting in the main city. The gospel has to move from Jerusalem, 
before it gets to the outskirts of Judea. And from there, from Jerusalem, they are going to go to Samaria. Huh? And if you check the progression of this ministry, it was from city to city. They majored in cities, not the villages. So now Paul sent us in Ephesus, which is a major center within the region of Asia Minor. And for two and a half years, he is preaching in a school. Ah, I like the idea of a school. It's called the school of Tyrannus. He is having a full-time ministry. Day in, day out. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, up to Sunday. He is preaching from that school. Now, what do you think is going to happen? How do you think the gospel reached the whole of Asia Minor? Because there were disciples. In every city like Nairobi. Now, if you sample the people who are here, if you people get it, if you sink in what we are did, doing, if it was the first time, if this was the only church in Kenya, oh, come on. And you received and grasped the message that we are preaching here. Isn't, is it, is it not going to be the same message, Matthew, you will preach when you go to Ajenga? You, Matthew, will start a church in a, in a place called Wajenga. Who do you think they will be hearing? They will be hearing the word of God as it has been preached in Ephesus by Paul. Hey. Then we will go to Nakuru. Somewhere at Dondori. Even Dondori will hear the word of the Lord. Oh, blessed be the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on now. And some other people. We will go to Wanjerere in Muranga. There's a place called uh, Wanjerere. Ask me where that is. So Wanjerere will hear the word of God. From this place. Because that's where you come from. Huh? Can I give you another very funny word in Muranga? Nyagatogo. Even Nyagatogo will hear the word. I'm mentioning those words because that's, that's where some of our bishops come from. I have been there, so I have visited them in their homes. Praise the Lord. Some will take it to Quisero. All right? That is beyond, that is beyond Maseno. They will move from here. And where is Kibet? Is Kibet in the house? He is back in Sunday school. And Kibet would take it to us in Gishu. That is how, within a period of two and a half years, while Paul was in Ephesus, the whole of Asia Minor had the word of the Lord. It does not mean that Paul was visiting every nook and crook, every small village within Asia Minor. It just means that the people whom he impacted started impacting others from where they had come from. They took it there. And it was easy to get the gospel in the whole of the region when you're doing it from the main city. Ah. Hallelujah to Jesus. That was just a comment by the way. Now, like Jeremiah, we are going to uproot and we are going to tear down. Oh, blessed be the name of Jesus. The Bible records that God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick. And their illnesses were cured. The evil spirit left them. So here we're talking about miraculous signs and wonders happening. God was doing these things by the hand of Paul. Hmm. I think that this, this chapter is so old that you would want to discuss this thing the whole day. The business of aprons and handkerchiefs. We know we always try to create the ministries of aprons and handkerchiefs. 
Can I tell you that we don't even see it repeated with another apostle, but, but some of us feel like uh, we can start a ministry of aprons and hard kitchens. No, you have to be led by the Holy Spirit. Please remember it is God who was doing these things through the hand of Paul. Yes, God can do it again. But please don't force things. Believe God. Let God show you what you need to do in a given situation. Hallelujah. The Jews, those people are not very unfamiliar with things like clothing and you remember even the priestly garment, those who have ascended the priestly garment. At the end, at the end of the, the, the hem of his garment, for the woman who was having an issue of blood, why is she, she reaching out to a piece of his clothing? Because in the theology of the time and understanding of the time, there is some healing that can flow the symbolic, the significance of the hem of his garment. So these people are familiar with even something which can touch you, if it touches you, you know, something that is with me or touching me, if it touches you, they are familiar with that. But if here you start just applying aprons like that, people are not familiar with the mutiary. So God may have to look for another way the first people stone you <laughs> as a witch doctor in the village. Alright? However, the Christian, we understand these things because we have been taught. But some people have not been taught. The woman uh, who had an issue of blood didn't have to be taught a lot. She had grown with this. And she knew if I only touch but the hem of his garment, my problem will be over. So healings and miracles are happening by the hand of Paul. And I want to see that there is an uprooting that is taking place. There is a scattering that is happening as Paul is ministering from Ephesus. Hallelujah. Let's read on. I hope we, we are reading at the back there. Some Jews who went around during the driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. Now, the story of the sons of Sceva is well known by all of us. Oh, come on. They, they do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not disciples. They have not submitted and submerged themselves under the authority and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they want to use him. They realize there is a power, like Simon also realized. There is a power right there. And they want to use it. For them, the aid justifies the means. That kind of philosophy is called pragmatism. They don't care about Jesus. That if you can mention the name of Jesus and the demons will go out, then we are in business. So for them, it doesn't matter how they do it, provided it happens. Hello. But you know the story. They were going to be torn by that demon until they went back home without profit. Ask Paul, we know, Jesus, we know, and Paul, we know, but who are you? This is a confrontation. They didn't have the power to confront demons, but it also means that Paul had the power to confront such demons. They didn't have an answer when it is if it is Jesus and if it's Paul, we've got to go out. But if it is you, sons of Sceva, we're not moving an inch because this is confrontational when you are on our side you cannot push us when you belong to the same kingdom we are in you cannot do nothing to us <laughs> you can't be like them and push them out so they couldn't handle but 
Paul is confronting such spirits and such powers. He is uprooting and scattering. Blessed be the name of Jesus. I am coming down to this, friends. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. Amen. Can you see that now we are uprooting and scattering? We are demolishing and, you know, destroying. Okay, things are going to be destroyed very seriously here. They come and they confess of their evil deeds. Not just that. A number who had practiced sorcery. Oh, come on now. Those who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. Oh, we are destroying and scattering. We are demolishing and destroying. Come on now. The magic of Jeremiah is working here for the church of Jesus Christ by the hand of Paul. Amen. When they calculated the value of scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, can we say in this way, verse 20? In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Amen and amen. Jeremiah, go speak my word. Now the word of the Lord grew mighty throughout that place. And it was powerful. But I want you to understand that that is what kingdom people actually are meditated to do. Hallelujah. There was a tearing down, there was an uprooting. There was a destroying, there was an overthrowing. But at the same time, there was a planting, there was a building. The church was being built up. Come on now. The word of God was growing mightily in the land. Transformation was happening. Paul and his team, they were coming face to face with another kingdom. It's an imposter kingdom led by the devil. And the devils were confessing that they know Paul and they know Jesus. And they're not going to recognize anybody else. So there is a confront. I want us to understand kingdom people that when you occupy your position and do what God has asked you to do, you'll be standing against a heavy wall. Okay? And the world will not go down quiet on you. When I sit here. So, uh, we'll be proceeding with this in the next service to see that uh, one called Dementius who is uh, the chief of the copper smiths in the region, is going to rise up. There is going to be real trouble. We'll be looking into that. Amen. Because when people destroy, when you preach, did you know some businesses are based on the evil practices of the people? The evil cultural cultures they have adopted. Some people thrive. They live day to day based on that culture, its behavior, its way. Because that culture has created a way of living which has become the livelihood of some pharaohs. So when you preach the word of God, you start tearing some business practices down. You start scattering some economies. Oh, come on now. Yeah, some economies or economic pieces will get destroyed. You will scatter them. You will be tearing things down. Their framework, their structures are coming down. And they are going to be very angry with you. Because like, like Paul again in Philippi, he casts out a demon in a girl and a business just goes bankrupt. Hallelujah. Now, Paul has preached in the whole of Asia Minor, which worships Diana. <laughs> okay? A goddess God. And people are burning the statues 
And Paul is saying they are not gods made of by craftsmen. Those are not gods. So people are not buying our wares. What are we going to do? Demetrius is asking, what are we going to do about this? Was still, which was just an excuse, people are not going to be worshipping. Demetrius realized, if people don't worship Diana, nobody will be buying their statues. Business corrupts. Did you understand? Do you understand that sometimes when you preach the word of God, you are going to bring down some businesses. And those people raise their kids, they pay their school fees doing those businesses. Some brothels are going to close. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Come on now. Some bars, some pub places, some changa dens are going to close when you preach the gospel. For you say a good amen, remember somebody's livelihood is going up in smokes. Are you still going to preach? The culture of people, those who are steeped in their cultures, they are going to rise up against you. Because you are destroying them. You got a mandate from God to uproot and to scatter. You don't just do that as a church. You also plant and build. But not everybody is going to agree with your planting and your building. So this are confronting this kingdom. The, the woman of God, I believe she was a woman of God, Erin G. White, she is the founder of the movement that we know today as the Seventh Day Adventist movement. Erin uh, G. White wrote a, a book uh, very many years back, in 1800, I think, or before, I don't know. She titled the book, The Great Controversy. Ever, anybody ever saw that book? The Great Controversy. And she traces the controversy which has been there for over the ages between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of right. Amen? Please understand you are ambassadors. You are representatives of the kingdom of the right. Kingdom of our Lord and Jesus, Savior Jesus Christ who is king of kings and the Lord of lords. And the devil, though he is an imposter, wherever he reign, rules and reigns, he is also seen as a king. Okay? And every time now you have to approve and scatter. Remember, you are interfering with what he does. And he doesn't just go down smiling. He raises a lot of hell. Because that is all what he can give to people. Come on now. <laughs> the devil will raise a lot of hell for you. Hello. But you have to stand. God is going to be with you. That's what he told Jeremiah. God is going to be with you. He will protect you. He will stand by you until the work is done. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord bless you. May he give us the wisdom, the understanding, the knowledge to understand our mandate and to know that we will make it. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let me pray for those who will go out today. Heavenly Father, I pray. That as our brethren step out with this understanding that their words are going to be uprooting and scattering, destroying and overthrowing. I pray them that you give them the grace, the strength, the power to do that. You know, but also, Lord, that when it is all done, they will have planted. And they will also give them an opportunity to plant and to build faith in somebody so that a transformation will happen in the lives of many out there. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. The Lord bless you indeed. to tell